Yes, welcome everybody. So part of the gravitational physics seminar, which uh, Sumanto and me organized. And uh, we welcome Professor Paolo Pani from La Sapienza University in Rome. And we are very grateful that he has agreed to give this seminar. So the title is Black Hole Microstrate Spectroscopy. So Paolo, you can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure uh, to give this talk. And today I would like to uh, present some recent results that we have about uh, testing the, the nature of black holes and in particular near horizon structures uh, with uh, spectroscopy. So computing the uh, quasi normal modes at the ring down of um, these black hole microstates. Uh, so part of my talk would be um, devoted to uh, give an overview of the problem. So why we want to test uh, black holes and why we want to test uh, uh, in particular spectroscopy. And then I will focus in the second part really on the, um, uh, on the specific problem of black hole microstates that are uh, solutions arising in the so-called fastball proposal. And I hope that by the end of my talk, I will, be, I will clarify what say this, this uh, a plot that I'm showing here are these are the uh, a way to see how the different black screen down as compared to the black hole case. Um, so well, the motivation. Uh, so if you work on the motivation, we know that black holes are now everywhere. Uh, this was not the case a few years ago, uh, but now we have detected them. them uh, in the both electromagnetic and uh, gravitational wave band, both supermassive and uh, star mass black holes. And these observations and theory uh, have already uh, been awarded the two Nobel prizes. Maybe there will be more in the future. Uh, but uh, so the, the most natural the question is, why do we want to still test this picture since it seems to be so uh, solid nowadays? There are several motivations, in fact. The first one is that uh, there might be black holes as uh, predicted by GR in the universe. There are neutron stars, we know them, but there might be other objects uh, that populate the universe together with black holes and neutron stars, other compact objects. And those compact objects might, for example, explain some of the weird events that LIGO and Virgo have detected so far, for example, in the so-called mass gap uh, forbidden by astrophysical observations. And there are at least two events fit very well the, the standard picture. Uh, we also don't know exactly how to form supermassive black holes at high redshift. So what are the seeds of these black holes? And these might also be uh, something in which there is room for, for alternatives. And in general, well, uh, we want to understand better dark matter, and there, be, there is the possibility that dark matter is formed by uh, compact objects uh, made of, uh, say, new fundamental fields, as in the case of boson stars. So these are all motivations to go beyond the black hole picture. There is then one more fundamental motivation, uh, and this is the main, uh, the main one for my talk, that we want to test the quantum nature of black holes. And this might be very bold and uh, optimistic in the sense that uh, according to uh, common law, the quantum properties of black holes are only important for those black holes which are very small, so that the curvature is compared to the curvature at the Planckian scale. Uh, but nevertheless, um, there are other proposals in which trying to solve the information loss paradoxes or uh, resolving the singularities within the black holes or other problems, um, they change the structure of black holes, not only in the interior, very close to the singularity, but also at the horizon scale. So at scales which has nothing to do with, with Planckian, in fact. Um, several of these proposals, some of them are quite vague, some other are more uh, concrete, and I would mostly focus on this fastball scenario in which uh, the classical black hole is replaced by an ensemble of regular horizonless uh, compact objects, or well, regular horizonless microstates, in fact. Um, this might appear a bit bold, but uh, an important point I want to make is that, well, we now have all these informations coming from gravitational wave observations, for example, and this is not going to change dramatically in the, in the near future. So for a few years or decades, maybe, um, this is the kind of observer, I mean, observational status we have to deal with. 
And if we don't test these, these scenarios now, probably uh, we will ne never do so. So it's, it's just the right time to do it. Uh, and finally, the, the last motivation is we want to quantify the black holeness of different sources across different mass ranges. For example, to do a Bayesian model selection between, say, black holes and something else. And for these, we need models. So we need to understand uh, the ring down, for example, for different models. And it goes without saying that any deviations from a classical black hole will imply either new physics, say deviations from GR, new matter fields, so beyond standard model part, uh, and it will be very, very interesting uh, in general. Um, okay, so the way to quantify the black holeness, say, of a given source are, are manifold, but there are at least two ways. One is checking the compactness, so how compact the object is, where is the effective horizon, uh, sorry, effective radius of the object. And one can parameterize this in terms of an effective radius R0 that is displaced relative to the black hole horizon, is the black hole horizon by some quantity epsilon. And supposedly epsilon is, is small, but in fact is a free parameter. Uh, the other dimension that is important is the reflectivity because classical black holes are perfect absorbers, but anything that is not a black hole is in fact not a perfect absorber. So the reflectivity can range between zero, which is the black hole case, and say unity, which is a perfect reflector. For example, perfect fluid neutron stars do not absorb at all gravitational waves, so they are in fact perfect reflectors and they stay here at reflectivity equal to one. So in this diagram, black hole stays here uh, at, the, at the origin and you have different corners depending on whether you have small compactness or no absorption or large compactness and large absorption. And well, there are different, uh, what are called exotic compactness that may uh, populate this diagram. It's clear that the closer you go toward this direction, so large compactness, large absorption, the harder it will be to distinguish the objects from a black hole because the two are very similar. So in this diagram, an important uh, sort of separatrix is given by the epsilon being smaller or larger than the unity because this defines whether the object has a light ring or not. Um, so a light ring is, uh, uh, the location of uh, circular photon orbits around the objects. And then if you wish to test the quantum nature of black holes near, say, a Planck scale near the horizon, this epsilon has to be tiny, about 10, uh, 10 to 40 for, say, a solar mass black hole. So it's clear that there are huge, there is a huge difference in orders of magnitude between these scenarios, and you might need different uh, um, tools or different observables to test them. So overall, the question is how to how do current and future observations constrain this parameter space? So this is in general. Now going to what I would like to discuss uh, later in my talk, uh, a few words on the fastball proposal. So in this proposal, as I said, classical black holes are as an ensemble of a huge number of regular horizonless microstate geometries, and there's been a lot of work theoretical work on this, uh, on this subject. And the idea is that while a classical black hole is an horizon and then a singularity inside, in the fastball picture, the horizon is, is absent and the geometry ends up with some regular cap here instead of a singularity. And a black hole is really considered as a statistical ensemble of many different geometries, these microstates, which are regular, uh, but they can be deformed in, in several different ways. In fact, there, are, there is a huge number of microstates, and this is important because the hope of this program is also not only to, to solve the singularity problem and the uh, information loss problem associated with the horizon, but also to account for the whole entropy of a black hole, which is huge, in terms of these microstates. And this can be done in, in, some, uh, in some scenarios. Um, so the pros of this model is that it's very well motivated from a theoretical point of view, and also some solutions are non-analytically, actually a huge number of solutions are non-analytically as low energy truncation of some string theory, typically in supergravity theories. And an important point is that the mass is a free parameter. So this proposal can in principle explain both, say, 
black holes or supermassive black holes or tiny black holes um, without any problem. Uh, the cones instead are that typically the solution are very complicated. They are mostly known for supersymmetric theories, even though there's been some recent extension, but uh, in general, they have several charges and they are very complicated. There are also open issues is more related with what it means, what does it mean by measuring something in this proposal, whether one measure a particular state, that what is called a typical state or a atypical state. Um, and well, I mean, I can refer to this nice review by Daniel Meyerson for more uh, discussion about this topic. Uh, for what I well, what concerns me, what I would do is to try to test this scenario with gravitational waves. And the picture one can have in mind is that uh, the signal um, in a binary, so in a coalescence, can be decomposed in different phases. And at each of these phases, there are clear signatures of the presence or absence of a horizon. Um, and for at least in the most part of my talk, I will focus on this part here. So after the merger, understanding the ring down and uh, how the modes that dominate the ring down changes and whether there is more than, uh, uh, than the ring down itself. But the spiral, if I have time, I will also discuss the spiral later because it's also interesting in, sense, in certain aspects. So uh, the, the common law is that the post-merger signal of a coalescence can be a model as a superposition of quasi nova modes. So these are complex frequencies. There is a real frequency and um, imaginary part that is associated with a damping time. So these are damped sinusoids. Uh, and the good point is that already now, uh, but most uh, better in the future, with future detectors, we are going to see several events, actually hundreds of events, for which several modes can be measured uh, and extracted from the signal. And in this way, one can really do black hole spectroscopy, for example, understanding whether the whole spectrum is consistent with that of a curved black hole. For a curved black hole, the spectrum depends only on the mass and spin. Uh, for other objects, there may, may be corrections to this, uh, uh, to this spectrum. There may be new modes, uh, extra features that are not present for, for a curved black hole for which the ring down is in fact quite, uh, quite easy. Um, so let me give you uh, uh, one slide uh, overview of what, what happens in the black hole case to understand why it's different from the case in which there is no right. In the black hole case, the problem can be model. Uh, I mean, you, one can solve linearized Einstein equations and uh, uh, write them as a, uh, essentially as a linear perturbation equation with an effective potential that in some coordinate looks like this one here. Uh, the horizon in this coordinate is at minus infinity and well, plus infinity is the asymptotic infinity. The photon sphere, so the light ring of a black hole appears because of this maximum here. So the maximum is associated with the photon sphere. And the modes, the quasi modes, are the eigenvalue of this problem with ingoing boundary conditions at the horizon and outgoing boundary conditions at the same. Now, an important point is that radiation takes infinite time, infinite coordinate time to reach the horizon. And this already tells you that. Um, the boundary condition of the horizon, so the fact that the reason horizon cannot uh, directly um, influence the quasi normal spectrum, at least not uh, uh, within the time that the radiation takes to probe the boundary, the, the boundary, which is very important because it means that if there is no horizon, and for example, there is a regular solution or there is some other uh, effects that remove the horizon, but anyway, change the boundary conditions. This will be important only at very late times after the radiation uh, re probe it. Um, and in fact, anything that is not a classical black hole will uh, eventually reflect some of the radiation. So if there is a classical black hole, all the radiation that goes here has to go inside the horizon. There is no way it can bounce back. Otherwise, there will be even maybe just a tiny amount of radiation that goes back, but so there will be some reflectivity for the object. That's the that's important point. So most of the radiation maybe will go inside, a part of it, a fraction R, will actually be reflected. 
And in fact, there may be trapped modes within the, the interior of the object and this photosphere barrier. These are low frequency mode that lives in this, in this barrier. So there, are, there might be many different ways that uh, uh, this um, reflectivity can arise. And in general, R equals zero, so no reflectivity can be taken as a definition of a classical black hole. Anything else will have different reflectivity. And by the way, as I was saying, a standard neutron star will have 100% of reflectivity just because it does not absorb any gravitational wave. Uh, nevertheless, the boundary, prob the boundary value uh, problem of this associated with a different uh, metric, uh, horizonless object, is very different. And in fact, if you compare the quasi modes of uh, an horizonless object with those of a black hole, you totally different. So here I'm taking a different uh, exotic compact object, not a black hole. These are the quasi modes of a Svarshi black hole. And in the black hole limit, so when the, the compactness of the object reaches that of a black hole, so epsilon going to zero, the modes of an exotic compact object goes down here. And you can see that they are very different from the black hole case. And in fact, the, I mean, the scale is totally different. It's a logarithmic scale. Uh, and the reason is that these modes are in fact related with the trapped mode within this barrier. Uh, so one may ask uh, what happens to the ring down uh, in this case, and this has been studied in several papers and in much detail. Um, recently, what we have been working on is to use the membrane parallel, in fact, an extension of the membrane parallel, to understand uh, in a model independent way the ring down and the quasi modes of uh, exotic compact objects. And the idea here is that instead of having a horizon, a classical horizon, um, uh, in the classical black hole membrane paradigm, one replaces the horizon with a fictitious viscous membrane. And it turns out that if the shear viscosity of the membrane uh, has this value here, one over 16 pi, then the quasi spectrum of this membrane is the same as that of a black hole in GI. So what we have done in this paper here with Elisa Maggio and other collaborators uh, was to um, study the ring down in the membrane parallel when the shear viscosity, the zeta, is a free parameter that, by the way, is related with the reflectivity through a formula like this one here. So when eta is equal to eta black hole, this value, the reflectivity is zero, as in the black hole case. Otherwise, it can be different numbers. And again, the parameter space is, is two dimensional because there is also epsilon, uh, the, the compactness. And what I'm showing here are the relative differences between the real and the imagined part of the mode of this object compared to the black hole case. And what you will see is that they are typically large, about 10, 20%. So already in tension with what has been measured, for example, for GW15 or 914, except for a small region here it is not excluded by observation uh, at the moment. An increase of SNR, so signal to noise ratio of about a part of 10, uh, would, uh, uh, would completely rule out all this region here. So this is very promising because it would uh, rule out a huge uh, class of uh, exotic compact objects that can be modeled in this way. Uh, what happens if epsilon is smaller. So here in this plot, I'm showing up to epsilon 0.01. And the reason is that for smaller values of epsilon, the, the time radiation takes to probe the boundary is long, is longer than the prompt ring down. So what happens is that, as I was saying, the prompt ring down is equivalent for any class of object that has epsilon smaller than this value. So it's equivalent to that of a black hole. And the reason is that this prompt ring down has nothing to do with heavy horizon or not, it's really just the perturbation of the photon sphere. So for each object with a photon sphere similar to Svarshid, we would expect something very similar to this. The main difference is that if there is no horizon, part of the radiation again can be reflected back and eventually will reach infinity and be reflected back and forth in this potential barrier that I was mentioning before. So it will start exciting the photon sphere and then go back and forth here appearing as a modulated train of radiation that was called gravitational wave echoes. Um, the interesting thing here is that the echo delay time 
scale logarithmically with this parameter epsilon, which is very good if, if you want to probe uh, uh, plant scale physics near the horizon, because even if you put this boundary, say a plant length away from the horizon, still is not huge because of this logarithmic correction. So it's still something that can be probed with current detectors. Uh, so yeah, this is the picture one can have in mind that the prone drain down is the same as that of a black hole, while for a black hole the signal dies off. If you have some reflectivity because of this reflect, reflection back and forth between the, the interior of the object and the photosphere, eventually you will reach uh, infinity and appear as this modulated train of radiation. Each time they are smaller because part of the radiation escapes to infinity but they are sort of repeated in time. Um, well, so this was a few years ago, and by the, after that, there was a lot of interest in trying to look for this effect in uh, current data. with contrasting results because some group independently found evidence for echoes in LIGO data, uh, others did not, and well, LIGO, Virgo collaboration, actually looked in this, in this uh, to this problem and well they did not find any statistical evidence in the full catalog of one or two and o three a data uh, but still it's, it's quite interesting that um, this is now routinely searched for uh, in uh, level virgo data and is well is one of the main i would say test of gr and natural black holes that can be done with radiation waves still the prospects are quite uh, positive because LIGO can probe um, echoes only if the reflectivity of the object is very close to unity, while future detectors, which will have a much larger SNR in the ring down, like third generation detectors, science and task of Cosmic Explorer or LISA, will probe echoes in a region much closer to reflectivity equal zero, so potentially ruling out uh, even small corrections away from the black. Uh, this requires a lot of way for modeling, and I'm not going to enter in any details here. I can refer to this nice uh, review by uh, Bayesian collaborators um, for yeah, any, any detail on the way for modeling. Let me just mention that the echo signal is very complicated in general because it depends on the spin and on the reflectivity. And here I'm showing different snapshots with different reflectivity and different spin on the, on the random. And you can see the two colors are two different polarizations. So you can see that there are several features which make things very complicated to model. And still this is a toy model because I'm just fixing the reflectivity and this is not even frequency dependent. Um, so very recent month actually here and with Elisa Maggio and uh, Anupa Matsumar, we are working on um, a more concrete model uh, that is still a toy model for, for quantum corrections at the horizon scale, but uh, it, it sort of highlights uh, what, what's going on in this case. And the idea here is to replace the membrane that I was talking before with a quantum membrane that is uh, discussed by, described by a, a quantum fluid, so with some uh, uh, waveform that we are just taking to be uh, an exponential with some width and some uh, localizing space. And then the point is to uh, apply the standard uh, membrane paradigm, so the, the junction condition of this membrane, not with a classical fluid, but with a quantum fluid that is an, an average over these uh, different states. And the, the, the results that we are currently wrapping up is that uh, the, uh, the reflectivity that I'm showing here is frequency dependent. And here I'm showing the frequency dependence. It, of course, depends on eta, uh, this, this shear viscosity. But even in the black hole case, so when eta is equal to eta black hole, because of this quantumness of the fluid, what happens is unity for low frequencies, so frequency much smaller than this sigma here or uh, it decays very quickly and becomes practically zero at higher frequencies. And this is interesting because it means that depending on the frequency content of your perturbation, you might have or might not have reflections. And in fact, here is a time domain evolution of a scalar field in this 
scenario. And what you will see is that depending on the viscosity, even in the black hole case, you might have some sort of repetitions, some sort of bumps due to these reflections, um, even at frequencies that you might not expect to excite during the ring down. So this is something interesting that uh, we are still uh, exploring what is potentially uh, a smoking gun for, for, this, for this effect. Uh, so all of these to go now to something, so a concrete model, um, because the I show you now the, the ring down in some control setting, but if one wants to really study these black hole microstates, uh, uh, it's important to have a, first a solution and then do perturbation on top of them. Uh, so what we have done recently in this work here, uh, led by Teishi Keda here in Rome, and, uh, uh, a lot of other collaborators coming from string theory in Torvald data uh, was to study the uh, a test scalar field on the background of uh, some solution of n equal to supergravity. And these are the microstates that describe the fastball in, in this theory. And the, the interesting thing is that these microstates are very irregular. I mean, while a black hole has a sort of regular shape, as Varshi black hole, for example, is topologically a sphere. Here, the, the geometry is very deformed because these solutions lack any spatial isometry. So they are not spherical, they are not axisymmetric, they can have any shape. Uh, so they're very complicated. In fact, they, they can be studied as solutions which are even non analytically in terms of different centers. So they are called multi-center solutions because depending on where these centers here or these harmonic functions, um, they can describe different solutions. And the, the limit, the black hole limit is when the, all the centers collapse to a single point. And in that case, um, you get the black hole solution, okay? Um, interesting enough, these, uh, Geometries do not have an ergo region, so they do not suffer, for example, for region instability. This is, a, this is an instability that um, affects rotating solutions with no horizon but with an ergo region. So, in principle, these solutions at least are believed to be uh, stable, uh, even though a stability analysis was not uh, performed before, before our paper. Uh, and even though they are solutions to supersymmetric, uh, uh, so supergravity, the same technique that we use, so a three plus one evolution of the Klein Gordon equation, works in any generic microstate, so even for non supersymmetric solutions. So here are the results. What I'm showing here are different time snapshots, and these are simulations performed by Taishi. Uh, first row is the black hole case, second, the third row are these specific microstates that we are focusing on. But I mean, the same applies to any microstate. Uh, what you'll see here, there are two features. The first one is that we are starting with a spherical Gaussian profile. Uh, and in the black hole case, the black hole is spherical again. And you see that you, you start with something spherical and the sphericity is preserved because the background is spherical symmetric as well. While in the fastball case, you start with something spherical, but then it gets deformed because the background itself is breaks the spherical symmetry. The second feature is that you see in the black hole case, the signal grows, but then it decays in time quite uh, fast. Uh, and this is the typical ring down. So it's an exponentially uh, suppressed uh, oscillation. In the fastball case, instead, there is still a lot of signal, even at late times, um, for example, 100 amps, and this is due to the fact that there is no horizon, so the perturbation survives longer. And to show better this point, I can show a, let me see if I can open this. Yeah, I can show you a animation. Uh, so what I'm gonna plot, maybe here, what I'm gonna show is the, the, ring down on the x y plane of one of these solutions and on the top you will see the time snapshot so it's in unit of total mass so it's important to see that we will go up to very high m and you see you start with something spherical but you can see that there is some structure in particular there are there is a dipolar quadrupolar structure a triangular shape 
And this is due to the fact that the background is actually has this uh, deformation. And if you look at the, so let me just stop for a moment, look at the time, there is still a lot of radiation uh, at very late time. So there is still structure uh, in this in this ring down. And more um, practically, uh, what uh, we can show is really in, in the, as a function of the time, uh, the scalar field in the black hole case and in the fastball case. As you can see here in the black hole case, there is a decay, exponential decay. This is the so-called power low tail that is typical of the black hole ring down at very late times. But in the black hole case, nothing special happens. If you start with a spherical mode, you only have L equals zero and equal zero, the composition. If you start with a dipole, you will have L equal one and equal one, for example. In the fastball case instead, we are only perturbing it with a spherical mode. But interesting, you get both L equals zero, but also L equal two. And the signal does not decay in time as in the black hole case. I mean, it does decay, but much more slowly. And also with some repeated signal that are very reminiscent of the echoes that I was showing before. The problem is that the signal is much less clean than as I was showing before. And the reason is that there is mode mixing so part of the L equal zero goes in L equal two, then in L equal four, et cetera. And everything is much more complicated because the geometry, as you can see, is deformed. So the potential, the limitation potential in this perturbation C is, is very irregular. Uh, but anyway, the, the signal decays in time. So as a bonus result, uh, this was the first proof that microstate geometries are dynamically stable, at least for a test scalar field. Doing the full gravitational case is way more complicated. It can be done in principle with these techniques, but it's, it's challenging. Uh, an important point is that one can compare these with the, uh, the so-called geodesic approximation. So trying to compute the quasi normal mode just by looking at the geodesics of the space-time. And for these black hole solutions, uh, so these microstates are microstates of a given black hole, which is a charged black hole in supergravity theory. And this is the analytical results in terms of the charge ratio of this black hole for the real imaginary part of the modes. And in fact, if you extract from our simulations the modes, it works quite well, especially at large L when this approximation works. So the geodesic approximation works in this so-called a corner limit when L is very large. So everything works pretty well. Uh, what you can show in this table here is that the geodesics modes uh, of a fastball coincide with those of a black hole in the limit when L, L is the, uh, is the uh, separation, the distance between different centers. So the black hole limit is when L goes to zero as you can see here, the fast hole quasi normal mode, like this one here, starts approaching the black hole quasi normal modes as L goes to zero. And these are the prompt ring down modes that you see at the beginning of the signal. So essentially, these modes here, they decay as a black hole. In the black hole, they will just decay. Here, instead, they remain and they survive longer, uh, also producing echoes for certain uh, angular parts. Um, yeah, as a, as a technical remark, these solutions are in fact singular at the center. So the centers are singular. This is an artifact of the fact that they are actually higher dimensional solutions reduced to four dimensions. So a way to cure this singularity is uh, um, by introducing a cutoff. And here I'm showing how different cutoffs uh, change the result. So if you take the cutoff small enough, in fact, the, the signal uh, converges. So it's uh, everything is fine. The a better way to uh, deal with this singularity would be to implement the boundary conditions in 4D from the five-dimensional solution, which is in fact regular. And in this way, you will not have problems with the singularity because you know how to how to cross it, so to speak. Uh, okay, so um, I don't know if you have time, uh, sorry, if you have questions uh, so far. Otherwise, since I still have some time, I would like to discuss um, the multipolar structure of fastball. By the way, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Paolo, may I ask a question? Sure. 
So I have a two rather related questions. So all these structures which one's trying to verify with respect to the black hole, can I, is there any proof that they could be the end stage of the gravitational collapse or? Uh, yeah, so this is a good point. Uh, um, there is in fact no, um, no simulation showing this and uh, this is something actually we are currently working on because for example in the fastball proposal the reason so uh, for example these solutions here come from a well-defined theory uh, that which in this case is equal to super gravity. so one might ask if i take two of these solutions and make them collide even if they do not have a form a black hole or not for example and this is unknown in fact or even a simpler uh, question whether they are stable, whether a single one single dissolution will collapse and form a black hole. Because the point, for example, in this specific scenario, black holes, the classical solution is a solution. So it is contained in the spectrum of the theory. So it is a solution and it might in principle be formed uh, dynamically. So yeah, this is a, a this is a currently an unknown. Uh, and in other cases, for example, for boson stars, those are known to form dynamically and uh, say the, the merger of two boson stars can form either a boson star or a black hole, depending on the initial data. But those are not meant to really replace the, the horizon in, in general. So they, they might have, I mean, they might exist, but uh, uh, they are not really black hole mimickers in this sense. And does this uh, fuzzball geometries have light ring? Uh, they all have light ring. Well, not all, in fact, but uh, they have light ring. In fact, uh, I don't I think I don't have them. But when we see this ring, this prompt ring down, like here and here or here, uh, these are um, fuzzball with a light ring. Okay. They might also not have a light ring, in which case the the yeah the radiation is not trapped very well. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Um, uh, I have I have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. So in this uh, uh, table that you show, uh, with which black hole are you comparing the 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 quasi normal modes? So this is uh, it's a good question. Here uh, we are comparing uh, with uh, uh, the spherical symmetric black hole. So is this is the black hole? That is the mic that uh, so is the black hole for which these microstates well, for which these fatal solutions are the microstates. Okay, um, so in fact, is this black hole is the the black hole that you will reach if all the centers collapse to a single one at the center, and then you will have a black hole which is uh, uh, it's not razor nose, but it's a charged black hole in spherical symmetry. A another question that might be also of interest is. I could compare this with a black hole with the same, for example, angular momentum, because these fastballs have angular momentum, uh, while the black hole does not. Uh, and yeah, and that's another interesting point, ch checking uh, what will happen with the, with the given angular momentum. In the black hole limit anyway, because this approach, a, the non-spinning black hole, the angular momentum goes to zero. So in the black hole limit eventually is the, uh, no spinning, uh, no spinning uh, black hole. The, this is only a technical problem in the sense that uh, in these particular theories, those solutions are the microstates of a no spinning black hole. In fact, uh, we are currently looking at a, a more generic problem using these solutions here uh, from this paper. These solutions are actually microstates of also spinning black holes and also non supersymmetric black holes. Um, nothing really changes dramatically in the picture, but uh, of course it's more challenging because then the black hole itself is spinning, so it's more complicated. Okay, and one more question. So in the previous slide, uh, the slide before this one, um, you have these, no, no, the one before. So you have these late time tails. Yeah, so these late time tails, uh, can you not get uh, by a theoretical analysis uh, for these uh, fuzzballs? Uh, yeah, we didn't try. The problem is that uh, um, it's very challenging uh, given the lack of symmetry. Uh, essentially, here we are really solving the three plus one equation because there is no separability. 
so it's really challenging to study the tails uh, in some, oh, I mean, in general, the perturbation in any sort of analytical way uh, other than the geodesic approximation. Um, so yeah, we don't have a clear, a clear understanding of, of how the late time behavior works. Okay, but at least from the from the higher dimensional point of view, you can say that uh, uh, geodesics might be trapped um, uh, at the place where the fuzz ball shrinks to zero size. Um, this is the analysis of Harvey Rial and uh, Santos, and uh, mm. uh, so from there, can one not infer the the late time tail? I mean, I just want. To... Ah, okay, okay. I see what you mean. Yes, I think so. And in fact, yeah, we actually have been discussing with, for example, George Santos. And other people mostly related with this uh, this behavior here because you see that the, the thing is going down very slowly and the question is whether eventually this becomes unstable or not um, because yeah their point is also that because of this very low decay uh, there might be nonlinear effects that make it uh, uh, unstable in this simulation we didn't see any any signature of this um, or this instability, because I guess also an important point is if there are if there is this uh, power low tail, how then say nonlinear effects sort of coherently or incoherently sum, and I mean the way I see this is that because the potential is very irregular, even if you have a mode that potentially can grow, eventually linear angular modes, for example, this L equal to does never remain an L equal to because there is this mode mixing. So part of the energy will go into the L equal four, L equal six, so there's a cascade. And in doing this cascade, uh, the things remain stable. Um, but yeah, it's something to, yeah, there will be some sort of power load in the same sense of real uh, yeah. uh, paper, but yeah, we did like, investigate it in uh, detail. Okay, thanks. Hi, Paolo, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a very stupid question. So this question is basically that in one of your previous slides, you were showing that there were a class of compact objects which uh, did not tend to the black hole uh, in the black hole limit or black hole QNMs in the black hole limit, right? Uh, but so fuzzballs are not included in that branch? Uh, they... Um, they, they are, in, in fact, all of them are included in the sense that, so this plot was for a very specific model, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, roughly you will get the same in, in any case. And, and yeah, this is an important point. The, the fact is, if you try, so if by quasi normal modes, you mean I want to solve the eigenvalue problem, uh, the eigenvalues for changing the boundary conditions, then the moment you change the boundary condition uh, from say having an horizon to having something else, like in the fastball, having a regular center, you will get different quasi normal modes in the frequency domain. The point is that when you then go to the uh, time domain, those quasi normal modes do not, uh, uh, do not uh, dominate the signal in time because the, the signal will be dominated initially by these modes here uh, that are very different from those of a black hole. So in the in the black hole limit, um, the, even the mode of the fastball would be different. What I was showing here are the modes from the so the prom, what I would call the prompt ring down modes. So those related with the geodesic approximation. So those that regulate this part of the signal, and that is universal. It does not depend on the boundary condition. It would be the same for all objects with a photon sphere, no matter the boundary conditions. But strictly speaking, the quasi normal modes of the fastball are very different from those of, for those of, of a black hole. And in fact, you can see then, uh, you can see this effect here, times where the quasi normal modes dominate, the signal is very different. So, uh, so can I just ask one more follow-up question? Sure. I was, I was just, uh, Wondering, so when you say the black hole limit, do you actually mean that you uh, you turn off the reflectivity uh, from the inner horizon? Is that what you mean by black hole limit? Um, in the fastball case, the black hole limit is uh, 
is, is consistently taken by, uh, so there is a free parameter in this solution, which is the position of these uh, centers. I mean, the centers are fixed uh, in order for the solution to be regular, but there is a still a free parameter, this L. So yes. one can uh, make L smaller and in the L equals zero limit, uh, uh, everything becomes the black hole. So there is no reflectivity we can play with. The reflectivity comes automatically out of the model. And uh, in the fatball case, the black hole limit is, for me, is really just taking L going to zero, where the geometry approaches uh, the black hole limit. In other cases, um, for example, in this toy model that I was showing before here, the reflectivity is a free parameter. So here, the black hole limit will be taking the reflectivity to be zero. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and for example, here as well, uh, in these models here, eta plays the role of reflectivity, so the black hole limit here is when eta is equal to eta black hole, plus uh, there is an extra parameter which is sigma, so sigma has to go to zero uh, to approach the classical black hole case. Okay, so how much time do I have? Sorry. I mean, you have half an hour, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Then, yeah, I mean, I just need uh, much less. Um, yeah, so let me spend some time on still the fastball, uh, but from a different point of view, because so I was showing the these, these are embedding diagrams. Um, and uh, the color scheme that I'm using here is not random, it's, it's actually something that related with the multiple moments of these fastballs. And, and therefore, I would like to spend some words on the multiple moment and in general, the multiple structure of, of FATWO, which is interesting on, on its own. And it's also interesting phenomenologically uh, because so far I was focusing on the ring down, but in fact, one can also look at the inspiral phase or the pre merger phase and try to see whether there are signature or not of these objects being black holes before they merge. Um, and this can be done with different techniques. So the ring down is studied by black hole perturbation theory. This is studied in spiral within post-Newtonian theory. So an expansion of Einstein equations in powers of V over C. Uh, and the signal, at least the phase, can be decomposed in different terms that they have different meanings. So the first one is what one could call point particle phase. And this point particle phase depends on the uh, multiple moments of the bodies starting at a uh, second pn order. So for example, the quadruple moment, the spin induced quadruple moment of a curved black hole affects the phase with a term that enters at two pn order. Uh, and the next nice property of a black hole is that there are no health theorems and essentially means that all properties of the black hole depends on the mass m and spin chi of the black hole. And in fact, there is this elegant uh, formula found by Hansen many years ago that relates the mass multiple moments of a curved black hole with the and the current multiple moments of a curved black hole with the mass and spin only. So ML are the mass moments, SL are the current moments. And in, in creating these diagrams, this is the partial black hole, and this is the bending diagram for a curved black hole, in which I'm a bit exaggerating the deformation. Um, what I'm showing here is that the shape is the uh, mass is given by the mass moments. So this is a spherical shape because there are no multiple moments; it's just a monopole. This shape instead has this form because a curved black hole has quadruple mass moment uh, uh, m equal four, m equal six, etc. While the color here is given by the spin moment, so the current moment. So different colors means different current moments. Uh, so this is the generic embedding diagram that I will show next. Um, for an exotic compact object, even not only for fatwa, but in general, of course, this formula does not apply anymore. There will be corrections. And so you can have different situations. For example, you can have situations in which you break the equatorial symmetry. Either really uh, the shape breaks the equatorial symmetry, so the mass moments are different, or Maybe the shape does not break the equatorial symmetry, but the color scheme does, which means that the current moments will break the equatorial symmetry. So the bottom line is that there are many moments that can be zero for current, non-zero for this solution. 
there can be corrections to this formula. And well, there, there is there are several studies, for example, this one here studying how the mass quadruple moment M2 or the spin octopole S3 can be constrained uh, relative to its care value. Uh, M2 and S3 are different from, uh, from zero in care, but they are different from the care value in other solutions. There is also an interesting, uh, what we, we like to call hair condition theorem that shows that within certain assumption, in particular, if you assume GR in the exterior of the object and the curvature at the surface of the object cannot grow indefinitely, um, within this assumption, the deviations delta ML and delta SL that enters in this formula here are bounded uh, in terms of the compactness of the object. So when epsilon goes to zero, these deviations have to go to zero as well in a certain way, either logarithmically or linearly or faster. Um, and this is interesting because the logarithmic corrections are those that are proportional to the spin, while the non-spin induced corrections are linear in epsilon. And again, this, uh, this, the appearance of this logarithmic term is potentially very important for to probe uh, quantum corrections at the horizon scale, because if epsilon is 10 to minus 40, as in say quantum correction for the horizon scale, this guy is zero practically, while is sizable and potentially uh, measurable. Uh, so if you're interested in with, uh, playing with these solutions uh, in this web page, there are several uh, analytical solutions obtained by solving Einstein equation perturbatively. So all these kind of weird shapes, and this was done uh, by former uh, PhD student Guillermo Rapos in our group. Going to the fatwall, so for, for fatwall, the situation is even worse or better, if you wish. Uh, because not only you get uh, these corrections here to the standard multiple moments of, of a curve black hole, but also the multiple moments are not numbers, but are actually tensors because there is no symmetry at all. So you don't have equatorial symmetry, which means you can have, for example, a mass octopole or a current dipole, uh, which they are both zero for care because of the equatorial symmetry. But also there is no axial symmetry either. So the say the, the mass quadruple moment is not a number M2, like in Svart in the care, but it's actually a tensor. And there are three independent quantities, M equal two, M equal one, M equal zero for these L equal two perturbations. And this means that if for a curve black hole you have a shape which is a deformed sphere, still equatorially symmetric and symmetric, for a fatball, you break equatorial symmetry, you break axial symmetry, and uh, well, everything is much more complicated. And this is the case of a uh, three center solution. Uh, interesting enough, so the multiple moments of a fatball can be computed analytically, they're very complicated and rich. Some of them are in ratios, say between S2 and M3 and things like that, which are sort of universal. This was studied in these two papers here. And also, at least for certain supersymmetric black hole uh, microstates, certain combination of the multiple moments seems to be, uh, well, first are, uh, well, the, the, they are invariant in a way, and also they are minimum for the black hole. So the fast hole seems to have always a larger multiple moments, which is not anymore the case for non-supersymmetric solutions. So these moments have to, uh, I mean, have interesting properties for fast balls on their own that might be used potentially to uh, look for this effect in data. The main uh, bottleneck of this is that uh, um, you need uh, waveforms to compute this effect. So you need to compute how this signal affects the phase here. And therefore you need to compute waveforms for generic deformation around care. And this is actually something we are working on, but it's still an open problem. So we don't know exactly how to um, model all these multiple moments in the waveform. Um, okay, well, I think I had some slides, but it's not here anymore. Okay, I can tell you, Anyway, a few words uh, without the slides on this term here. Well, this term is called the tidal heating, and this has to do with the fact that uh, in the presence of a black hole, there can be energy absorbed at the horizon, which is not the case for fat balls or for any exotic compact objects. 
And this is typically a small effect, which is hard to measure. Uh, finally, there is another effect, which is due to the tidal deformability um, that affects the phase at 5 pn order. Uh, and uh, it does so with a term that is called the tidal loft number. So this tells, tells you how much the object immersed in a tidal field is deformed compared to the black hole case. And the, the nice property of black holes in GR is that the love numbers of a black hole are zero uh, generically, uh, while any other object essentially does not have zero tidal love numbers. And this is already very good because it means that any measurement of the tidal love number we, uh, which is compact in would exclude the black hole case and would uh, uh, in immediately imply that the object is something else. Uh, and again, if one computes the love numbers of these black holes in the, uh, in the black hole limit, so where the compactness of the object goes to zero, they scale logarithmically with this parameter epsilon. So you get a, very, a formula very similar to this, but for the love numbers. So there seems to be a lot of this uh, observables the case logarithmically with epsilon, which is not a, uh, I mean, it's not by chance, it's really related to the fact that uh, the horizon, uh, I mean, a natural coordinate to, to deal with the horizon is the tortoise coordinate in which this logarithmic term is natural. Um, and this gives us an handle to compute these quantities and also to potentially observe them because the love number scaling logarithmic with epsilon means that the love number of say a fat ball or these solutions is not tiny, is something that can be potentially measured. So yeah, the, 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 the conclusion in this is that the quadruple moment, the tidal heating, and especially the quadruple moment and the tidal of numbers might be important in the spiral phase and one needs waveforms to, to constrain this effect. Um, so yeah, concluding the, well, all of these, are, it's very exciting because we have some discovery opportunity for new physics, both in the ring down and in the, in the spiral. And the, the black hole microscope phenomenology is now in full blossom. The, so far, these, these teams were studied for, uh, from a more theoretical point of view. And now the phenomenology is, uh, is something which is very interesting and very open problem. Uh, also because it's very complex and more messy than in toy models that have been studied so far, but potentially also more, more interesting. So I think that an important point is that horizons are special, and this is clear because, so even though they should not be any special point in GR, the moment you try to avoid them, uh, it happens so that many observables scale logarithmically with this parameter epsilon, which is great if you want to test quantum gravity. Uh, otherwise, I mean, if there is no such a scaling, it would be probably impossible to test uh, effects uh, at that scale. There are several open problems that if you want, we can discuss about fastballs. And one we already discussed about dynamical simulations, understanding formation of this object, and also whether they generically form or a black hole is still formed. And I think that toy those that we have been studying now uh, about quantum effects uh, near the horizon are still very useful to grasp general properties because uh, say fastballs are super complicated and simulations are very demanding, but at least isolating the, 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 the key ingredients and the key quantities uh, that uh, are expected in, in these quantum black hole scenarios is still very, very important to, to have a, a better clear picture. Okay, so I think I'll finish here and uh, yeah, I'm happy. We thank Paolo for this wonderful talk. We thank hope you. you'll be able to visit us sometime. <laughs> yeah, same here. I hope that <laughs> it will be possible soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Have a nice day. Bye. See you.